Welcome to the Libertarian Counterpoint. I'm Richard Fields. On the program today we have Jason McPhee, a, uh, a uh, scientist, a engineer at the California, state of California. Also John Cameron from uh, Pacific Legal Foundation fundraiser there, as well as the author of Rewire, Rekill, and the uh, forthcoming Aristocracy. Welcome to the show, gentlemen. Uh, did you bring your uh, cocktail swords and straws, or uh, you, the, the, the last ones that are available? Because they're about to be banned, right? Yes, and uh, in San Francisco, and, and uh, they've already banned apparently in Santa Barbara. And um, the, the banning um, is basically because of the, the fact that uh, people in this country according to the study that the banning was based on, use 500 million straws, you ready for this? A day, a day. The population of the United States is 360 million, it might be lower than that, 323? Okay, all right, so that means uh, one point, not, not carry the knot, 1.3 straws per person, including infants and children including people in, in rest homes, including people in, in mines down under the ground. Including me, who never uses a straw ever. Yeah. Well, I use a straw. I, I am one of those miscreants. I use a straw probably three days a week, four days a week. The health club that I, I go to provides uh, little cups with straws and towels. and it's, well, I'm going to move there and just live there. And... Um, but that 500 million seems like a pretty specious. Well, yeah, it was, uh, the, it was a me. school assignment for, done by a what, nine-year-old or eleven-year-old. Something like that. Yeah. Something like that. It was done years and years ago. And even if it were true, the United States of America produces only one percent of the plastic trash, believe it or not, that that ends up, you know, supposedly well, polluting I mean, our the, oceans there's a, there's on a, the planet. There's a, there's a bright side to this. Yeah. The bright side, I think it was Starbucks decided to get rid of straws and use a plastic sippy, cup. sippy cups, uh, you know, a plastic lid on the cup mm -hmm. instead, uh, and uh, to, you know, to avoid polluting the oceans with straw. Only one minor problem with that, which was that the amount of plastic in the uh, cup lid was greater than the amount of plastic in, of in the uh, in the straw. So I, I well, yeah. it was it's a, nice, it's, it was a, nice it's, it's a cute little sippy cup. Yeah. But what you will find is the straws are also available, and um, so I I think probably the next fashion accessory that you see from the mindless yet rich set will be gold personal straws or silver personal straws or diamond crusted personal straws, perhaps platinum that they carry with them. And that you can use for Coca-Cola or, or for cocaine. For cocaine, yeah. yeah. And, and they'll have, they'll screw together so that you'll be able to use the, the longer one to drink your drink so that the coffee stains don't get on your $100,000 smile that you paid for. And you just, and then you, your, your cocaine to give you the energy to shop for your next jewel encrusted straw. So it's, it's really just, it's ridiculous. Uh, is there well, a lot is of there is there a problem with plastic messing up the ocean? That's the the, the, well, the original question. And is that a uh, a tragedy of the commons issue? Too well, much, of course, too much. it's a it's a tragedy of the commons issue. But it it I'm willing to bet all of these straws are actually in one place, and it's that 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 uh, pile of trash in the Pacific Ocean, the size of Texas, that I can't find anywhere on Google Earth. I can't find a map to it. I can't find a picture of it. But it is, according to um, all of the liberal, this this um, this island of trash in the Pacific is the size of the state of Texas. And I'm willing to bet all of these straws are there now. Apparently, turtles like to snort um, cocaine, and so they they snort these straws in the hope that they can find. Somewhere when they Dregs come up on a rock, they can over. find some some cocaine somewhere. And I'm not. I don't think. I love nature. You love nature. You're a peak bear. You love to hike. I love to hike when I'm when I can do it. It's not that I I don't want. I like to scuba dive too. So I mean, it's not like I'm you know I don't care about the oceans. Yeah. The question, of course, is. Jason? Well, you know, one thing is, you know, this is one case. You know, that turtle video is what's uh, I guess sparked a lot of this. You know, going around. There, it's not like there's a huge data set of turtles out there mm -hmm. with straws stuck in their house. So there's this one data set, you know, point is what everybody's getting upset about in that video. But 
Uh, more to the point, there's there's a couple of issues I have. One is, what's the mechanism of how these things they're proposing that they're getting from our use out into the ocean? I mean, you can kind of understand where there's a there's an analogy with the plastic bags, you know, where you know that they banned here, and you have to pay an extra ten cents or something if you want to use a plastic bag. But with the the bags, when you know people would come and open the garbage can, if a wind blew up, you'd just see the bag take off, you know, and, and you'd see them wind up in all kinds of odd places because, they, you know, you could see the mechanism of how they'd get around. But I have yet to see a straw flying through the air. <laughs> well, know, in, so a, in, like, a, in a you know tornado or something. oh sure, <laughs> you know, you can see it's in flying, but I don't think there's many of those. And and, and I I absolutely agree. Yeah. You know what? Where's the scientific basis of this? And I almost suspect. Um, it's the same thing that happened with the clubbing of baby seals. Uh, I'm, I wouldn't put it past one of these enviro nuts. Uh, like, what, what was it? Um, which what, what was the enviro organization that actually was was filmed clubbing baby seals to I, death I because they, they the people who supposedly harvested baby seals said we don't do that. We don't kill. We don't beat seals to death with clubs. That's cruel. So they said, get out of the way, and then they did it and filmed it, and they were heard filming it, and and so I wouldn't put it past one of these enviros to catch a turtle and shove a straw up their nose to make a point. So, um, and turtles are, are kind of cute, you know. I hate to think of that happening, but again, I what's the mechanism? And and you know, if this this recycling thing worked, uh, then. How would these straws get there? I mean, people don't, you know, they don't. I'm, I don't think anybody is sneaking out on their surfboard into San Francisco Bay carrying a bag of straws and and deciding, you know, I'm going to throw it in the ocean, hoping that I kill the turtle. I don't. I don't get it either. Yeah. I don't get it. Well, you know, yeah. there's another issue with all this too, and it's you know, here government comes in to make the solution to a problem, whether or not it's real. You know, I mean, you know, there, there could be something to it, but. The, the issue is, now what's the solution? The solution is that instead of using this half cent plastic straw, um, you know, you're gonna wind up having to clean out a reusable straw. Well, if you clean out a reusable straw, you're using clean water, soap, and your time. And if this plastic straw only costs a half cent, you know, you'd really have to start wondering, you know. That detergent uh, makes its way into the ocean as well. Exactly, yeah. So, I mean, you'll have to wonder what's the bigger impact. And, and certainly, if you if you use the price signal to help guide you, if you stand there for a minute of your time cleaning out a straw every day to reuse it. <laughs> well, yeah, I mean, it's a little more complicated than that because you, because there is no cost, ostensible, ostensibly, there's no cost to pollution. It's, it's a, you know, it's it's a free good, so to speak, uh, from from a manufacturer standpoint or a consumer standpoint. So you have to make sure that you're you're accounting for costs sure. that uh, are otherwise not accountable for. But still, uh, I'm guessing that it's this is a uh, I'm going to say a mountain made out of a molehill, or a molehill made out of a mountain well, out of a molehill. And as you already said, the, 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 the plastic mm -hmm. in the lid, the plastic in the cup, far outweigh the plastic mm -hmm. in the straw. Well, we haven't even <laughs> talked about the health, you know, re recycling. Um, people aren't good at cleaning things. And if you, you exactly. know, stick something up your nose, the nose is an entry into, into your immune system. You know, you bypass the, the things that, that drain out in your nose. Oh, no, enough, uh, enough. <laughs> Or in your, yeah, it's, it's icky, you know. <laughs> Moving on. Uh, $32 million is the cost of Medicare for all. Trillion. A trillion. Trillion. I'm sorry, trillion. That's over 10 years. That's a million. You could three point Yeah, $3.2 trillion per year, I guess that would be. Uh, that, that's, uh, that's a lot of money. Uh, and, okay, explain to me how, that, how the numbers actually work, Medicare for all. Is there any way in hell that that's uh, even remotely affordable? Well, you know, they, as, this is the problem as you start, you know, this sort of a centralized system of, of medical decisions, you wind up um, eroding price signals, I guess. And for, you know, libertarians, uh, you know, we like markets, we like prices because those help us to decide what's the most efficient use of resources. And once you start piling all this money onto a program, you know, that, that is making decisions for you, it's, uh, it seems like, you know, where, you know, how's that working out for Cuba or Venezuela or all those other places? So. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's real simple. The programs or the services or the goods that we purchase from government are way more costly than those that we purchase from private enterprise. Education has had an inflation rate 
you know, double or triple of the uh, normal. 17% the, 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 yeah, upper education, the, the, 17%. The, uh, the inflation yeah. rate of everything else. Why? Because of uh, student loans and, and, and other government financing. Healthcare, uh, the more it goes to third party payers, particularly government third party payers, the higher it goes. In, uh, healthcare has had a, a price inflation much greater than the consumer price index. You name it, if it's government provided, it's going up in price faster. Why is it going up in, in price faster? Because there is no price signal being given. And if you just take a look at the real simple arithmetic, we're, people, I'm on Medicare, right? I'm, I'm 71 as of yesterday. So I am, a, I am one of the lucky beneficiaries of, of, of Medicare. And I pay a premium. Not only that, but young whippersnappers like, well, not you, but you, uh, pay a premium as well for my Medicare. Thank you very much. <laughs> so you're paying for my Medicare, I'm paying for my Medicare, it's still going broke. And now Bernie Sanders wants to put everybody on Medicare? How does the arithmetic work out? I don't understand. I, don't, I mean, it's, it's pretty you know, elementary that if, if, if you can't afford to pay for people who are 65 and older on Medicare, how in the world are you going to be able to pay for everybody on Medicare? It's just not, it's just not gonna work. Why is Medicare so expensive and why is, uh, really uh, the underlying issue, why is medical, our medical service so expensive? It's because we have entirely eliminated price signals in the healthcare market. We have and 30, competition. We have, it's a yeah. monopoly from top to bottom. We, yeah, if you want to build a hospital in Sacramento, you can build a hospital if you get permission from Kaiser and Sutter and UC Davis Hospital. If they, if they say, yeah, I think we need some competitors, then maybe you can build a hospital. If they say, no, we don't need any more uh, hospitals in Sacramento, you're not going to get it built. That's, and, it's that simple. And doctors. And if doctors you, through the AMA. Yeah. If you want to get a medical degree, first of all, you're going to spend a huge amount of money getting your medical degree, and the Quarter federal government dollars. makes it so that it has shut down dozens, probably hundreds of medical schools to make sure that the supply of doctors is constricted under the misguided theory that if you have lower supply, prices will be lower. It doesn't make any sense. And if you go to a foreign medical school, and foreign medical schools have proven uh, that they can produce doctors who, who provide a level of care equal to or better than the United States. Don't let them for, immigrate. But you, if you come in, then what you come in, even if you're an experienced doctor from another place, you basically come in as a medical school graduate. You have to take um, the, the graduate again. exam yeah at a level where you will uh, be admitted to a residency program and, and uh, re-enter a residency program, even if you've been practicing medicine in South Africa or Zurich or, or, or someplace where, where the standard of care is, is and out medical outcomes for surgeries and everything are the equal of what they are in or the better. United States. Or better. And, and um, I don't know how they manage to do it, but they train they train medical stu students there without depriving them of sleep every single minute of the program. I don't know how they do that, but they do it. Yeah, so, and and, yeah. and then and you've got a and then don't even get me started on insurance. I mean, we, we don't get started, Richard. We have insurance <laughs> for flu shots. We have insurance for uh, ha hangnails being being removed. I mean, every possible thing that you can go to the doctor for is covered by primary care insurance as opposed to paying for it out of pocket. What does that mean? It means me, uh, you, as a medical consumer, have no idea what you're paying for it, mm -hmm. and they charge what they damn well please, or what the insurance company thinks they can get by with. Insurance is for things that you don't think are going to happen, sure. not things that you know will happen. That's why the insurance model works for ma major medical, 10,000 and up, or 100,000, you know, whatever, whatever policy, whatever you can afford to pay for out of pocket, get an insurance policy to cover that. If you can afford to pay for it out of pocket, negotiate a price with, the, with your local pr practitioner, save a heck of a lot of money. That's the way it worked when I was growing up. We went to a family practitioner who set the arm for 100 bucks on a broken arm. Uh, he had an office that consisted of two people, him, the doctor, one person who was his bookkeeper and nurse com combined. Two people. Now you go into a doctor's office and for every doctor there's a half a dozen or more uh, and put paper, paper pushers doing the insurance work. And if you want a simple analogy, just imagine if we paid for our 
car transportation the same way we paid for our, our health care. You know, if you had an insurance company, so every time you went to, to get gas. To file a claim for a, yeah, yeah, a gallon of gas. Exactly, yeah. or to change your tires, you'd have to fill out forms in triplicate, but hey, you're not paying for it directly, so it's okay. You know? yeah. <laughs> of course, it, it obviously wouldn't be a very good system. What we need is not health care reform. We need health care deregulation all up and down the chain, and if we did that, we would have, we've got good medicine. We have good doctors. We have good nurses. We have uh, uh, a good pharmaceutical industry. But they're all in a situation where their prices and they are, they are all protected from competition and they all charge up the kazoo. Well, you know, to, to really dredge down into it too, I think uh, a lot of the stuff that always happens with good intentions and trying to say, hey, there's somebody out there who's having trouble affording it, let's have the government deal with well, it. Well, good intentions on the outside, bad intentions. Uh, when sure. you get right, when you cut down, sure. when you get to the chase. But I mean, you, you can. I think you can trace a lot of this back to emergency rooms. And at some point, you know, 50, 60, 70 years ago, you know, politicians said, you know, if you show up there, you will get covered. And so then the, the money doesn't come from nowhere. So they essentially have to price shift to everybody else who's paying. And that's when you start to see the prices start to get murky. And of course, we just keep going further and further down that path yeah, to where prices that. make no sense, and you're paying fifty dollars for a glass of orange juice or an aspirin. And a, you hospital. get yours that cheap? What hospital is that? <laughs> there you go. <laughs> Which hospital is that? <laughs> NIMBYs are against, well, NIMBYs, not in my backyard uh, activists, are against shade and four laundromats in San Francisco. Why? Well, it's uh, it just seems like the insanity of, uh, you know, it, Groups trying to plan other people's property for them. I, you know, the. Uh, well, tell me, give us give, what was the case. What? So, in at least in one of these cases, there was a person who wanted to redevelop. They they owned a laundromat, and it was a coin-operated laundromat, and they wanted to redevelop it into, I believe, uh, uh, housing to take care of some of this high-priced housing in San Francisco. So there weren't, and, wouldn't be as, quite as many homeless people? Uh, exactly. And you wouldn't need the poop patrol? Okay. Exactly. Yeah. And so uh, one of the first things that the community made him do was to do a study on the historical significance of of uh, coin-operated uh, laundry machines. <laughs> and, What's that? Historical And how much did that, co that study cost? Well, the, the study cost over $20,000 uh, right. added to it. And, and when the study came back, it That's said there was no historical significance. So. To a coin-operated laundry <laughs> Exactly. Okay. So it really didn't... They weren't know. ancient Maytags. Mm -hmm. okay. And so, yeah, but, you know, it, this just gets back into the, the problem. When we start going away from markets and we start allowing everybody to have a say on everybody Basically else's property. Basically allowing government bureaucrats to make decisions that uh, you and I in the marketplace can make on our own. Sure, and I mean, you have these problems that are, are popping up all over, uh, you know, the prices skyrocketing of housing, and yet we have people dragging their heels to be able to do anything and driving up the cost at the same time on trying to make solutions. And what was the next barricade that this uh, developer faced after he spent 20000 plus to uh, proved that his laundromat wasn't of a historical significance. I'm not sure if it was for him, but there was another case in Berkeley, but it might have also been in his case too, but I guess his building was going to create shadows in <laughs> places where people were offended to see those because shadows. Because Berkeley people so. live for the afternoon sun. Everybody knows that. As a matter of fact, when you drive, when you drive to Berkeley, suddenly somehow, because of its location, the, the afternoon sun is like no afternoon sun anywhere in the world. And people in Berkeley live for this, according to the supervisor. So that's why people live in Berkeley, is for the afternoon sun. And this, this apartment building is going to block that holy Berkeley afternoon sun. It would provide shade. Yes. And at least in one of these cases, uh, the, the argument was made that there was a schoolyard, and for two, day, two hours of the day, it would create a shadow over the playground. Well, I, to me, I like it if my kid gets to play in the shadows because, you know, for at least a few hours of the day because he's less likely to, to get skin cancer <laughs> running around out in the well, sun. Well, my solution to that would be, uh, okay. Are, are they not going to outlaw the morning fog uh, as well? <laughs> It might be on the uh, in the in the works. <laughs> why don't Why don't you don't have give my ideas? <laughs> the, why don't you have the guy who said that the shadow will fall in the schoolyard provide uh, if he's so concerned, let him be be uh, a servant to the community and provide um, for lights to um, make sure that this this schoolyard isn't in the shadow. We're making jokes about this, but there is an issue involved, and the issue is neighborhood effects. There are neighborhood effects to building something that provides shade 
or you don't want it or that blocks the view that you thought you had when you bought the property in the first place. Uh, and uh, you know, any number of other things. You know, the, the most egregious example of neighborhood effects are when you uh, pour your sewage out your, uh, you know, downriver, and, and you live upriver. So neighborhood effects are something that to be they're taken real. In, uh, to be, real. yeah, they're real, yeah. taken into consideration. But the market way of getting rid, eliminating, totally eliminating neighborhood effects is you buy the neighborhood. If you don't want to have a shadow from the lot next door, buy the lot. Mm -hmm. And you know, and build a, a low rise, or build nothing. That's the way you do it. You don't make other people pay for your view or for your convenience by having their property rights or their uh, right to enjoy their own property taken away from them. Sure, and it never ends. I mean, when you have an issue like a, uh, you go back to the key issue that started this. Uh, you know, the significance of coin-operated machines. <laughs> <laughs> just hard to imagine. Mm. Alex Jones was banned from, let me see here, Twitter, I think, for a little while anyway, Facebook, Apple, YouTube, Spotify, whatever that is. And the greatest problem is the SEC shot down his pirate radio station in Austin, Texas. Uh, is this a situation where uh, we're uh, having Alex Jones' uh, First Amendment rights uh, violated? Or is it uh, a, a way of shutting down a you know a, a evil conspiracy-minded rabble rouser? What is it? What's going on here? Well, I'm I'm um, I would think that even if he is an evil conspiracy-minded rabble rouser, that who is guilty of um, um, running afoul of the algorithms on all of these different programs that detect hate speech, that. Um, um, too bad that the the simple solution for for people not wanting to hear hate speech and one person's hate speech is another person's rallying cry um, is to simply not uh, follow uh, him, not read his, not see his tweets, not sign up for them, not friend him on Facebook, not um, be connected to him on Apple not go to his YouTube channel, uh, not listen to his podcasts on, on Spotify. Yeah, or whatever you do, Spotify. don't listen to his private radio station. <laughs> yeah, and, and uh, if he's got a radio station, uh, I, I seem to remember the way radios work is that if you want to have to listen to something... It's old-fashioned the technology, radio, but there's a knob. There. Yeah, the radio doesn't turn itself on and lock itself down and prevent you from changing either the volume or the station. So, um, you know, this, ho this whole idea of hate speech, um, you know, and in, in, um, I think it's abhorrent. Um, well, that, that's, that's one issue. But yeah. the other issue is Facebook, the last time I looked, it's a privately owned company, mm -hmm. uh, same way with YouTube. Same oh, no, they can all, the they can all do and it. And all they of them are ex essentially exercising the right, their, their First Amendment right to say, we don't want this speech, whatever yeah, it is, absolutely. on our platform. If Nothing I, wrong with if that. I didn't, I, didn't, I didn't make that point, I absolutely agree. But um, to, to um, the, the problem is now happening is that, that these, the, these electronic media are, are and I'm not really don't have this argument dialed in, so bear with me if it's not perfect. They are the commons now. This is where, well, where people yeah. go to to do whatever they do, and and even though they are privately held companies, like like basically Google uh, dominates um, the search market yeah. to something like ninety one percent. But and, there is a, there is there they, is nine percent that has, that takes the rest of the market, and if Google search is not doing their job properly, the other nine percent. Eventually, it'll be ten, twelve, yeah, fifty. Yeah, exactly. I absolutely agree. Here's here's yeah. the way I look at it. We're looking at a situation. Hillary Clinton was famous for complaining about the internet because there's no gatekeeper anymore. That was back during the uh, the Clinton impeachment scandals, the mm -hmm. Monica Lewinsky, and all that. She mm -hmm. was complaining that all of this stuff is you know all of this drudge stuff is getting on. Out uh, because there are the NBC, ABC, CBS, the New York Times, the Washington Post are no longer essentially censoring, according to government standards, what gets on the airwaves or what gets printed. Mm -hmm. And she was right. She was right that the internet was making it possible for a whole lot of information to get out there that never would have made it, never would have made it past the editorial desk of of uh, the, the three major networks or the, the Times or the or the Post. So what we had in the 50s and before was we had three 
networks, television networks, that controlled roughly 90% of television viewing. Mm -hmm. We had two newspapers that controlled probably, if you pick up, all, you know, if you look at the, how often they were reprinted in every other mm -hmm. uh, newspaper in the country, probably controlled a like percentage of, of, the, of print media. Mm -hmm. And both, or all five of them, were very closely allied with the CIA, with the deep state, with, you know, with government in one form or another. As they still are. And when, yeah, as they still are, but they don't have the influence that they did. The, the, uh, the three TV networks have a fraction of what they used to have. Uh, the, no, and, and print media, what? There's four. Okay. Yeah. Uh, and print media is the uh, same way. They, they have a, a fraction of the audience that they used to have. Why? Because the internet came in and hundreds of internet platforms, Alex Jones, from Alex Jones to, to uh, the Daily Cause on the left, they have taken over Essentially, the in a fragmented way, have taken over all of that all of that mind space, and that's a good thing because we're getting a, a diversity of opinion that is not under government control. Now, what's happening right now is Facebook and Google, in particular, are really worried about government coming in and regulating them. They're deathly afraid that they're going to be regulated as a utility. The FCC is already trying to do that, or the efforts have been made in that direction. They were just barely able to fend that off. I will bet you a dime to a dollar that what's happening is that the government uh, agencies, senators, congressmen are saying, you know, Facebook, we could regulate the hell out of you and make it really, really difficult for you to monetize all of, your, uh, all of the stuff that you've got going for you. Tell you what, you cooperate with us Get some of the, you know, get rid of some of these uh, players that we don't particularly uh, appreciate. Get them off your platform. We'll we'll go light on the regulation. I'll just bet you that's what's happening. So what we're ending up with is instead of having three networks and two newspapers controlling the media, we're having Facebook, Google, uh, and and uh, you know a few uh, internet platforms control what's going on in the media. And that would be a scary thing. I mean, I, I definitely am of the side that says, you know, look at, you know, they. they Alex Jones, you know, you may not like what he's saying. And, I don't. And, and I don't like it, what it, he says. I don't like, like what the Daily Cross says. It, it, but there's a lot of people in between that I do like. Sure, sure. And and the idea is, you know, let the let the market sort it out. And these are, you know, market participants. But if those market participants are having their strings pulled, you know, behind the scenes, that's when it starts to get a little bit scary, you know, if the government is distorting their their decisions. So. And that's the time, I think. If, yeah, we're, we're, I want to talk about... Uber and Lyft and Airbnb and how they're getting regulated out of existence, but we're, we're out of time. So we'll see you again next week, same time, same place, on the Libertarian Counterpoint on the air at uh, Channel 17 Sacramento, on the uh, internet at Facebook and at, uh, YouTube, as well as uh, uh, on the web at www.accesssacramento.org. 8 p.m. Thursday, noon Friday, 4 a.m. Saturday. Thank you very much for being part of the show.